one of the things that GV thinks a lot about is you know the, the amazing uh, advantage that artificial and intel artificial intelligence and machine learning have given some of the biggest tech companies. So when we look across a lot of the tech companies, many of which you guys have worked in, uh, we just see this massive advantage growing, this virtuous cycle of you know new data being produced, that data getting labeled, and machines learning from that data. Uh, to give companies in what is essentially an unfair advantage. First, Chris, can you give us a little bit of background of yourself uh, leading leading to now? Come around 2017, for me, it became really clear that AI was taking over. And so I kind of went on a vision quest, a journey to learn more about this and went through a couple of different places, including Tesla, where we were doing a lot of applied AI and the autopilot software team. Um, it, but then really joined Google because Google was the best place in the world to learn about AI. It was just a great time, a very formative, where a lot of amazing people were coming together. And that's where Tim and I met. One of the things that jumped out at us um, as we met the two of you is that often when we're engaging with enterprises, CTOs, CIOs, and we're talking about you know AI and its use in their business, they're struck by a couple of things, like the, the tremendous optimism that we have for how useful AI can be over time. And then also, you know, a slight bit of pessimism about how it's working today. What is broken about AI today? What is the, what is the problem that, that you guys see uh, as we try to commercialize AI going forward? To me, one of the things that's really profoundly clear is that there's a bunch of potential. As you say, there are many chips, right? There's many algorithms. There's all kinds of new research flowing out of academia all the time. Um, but very little of it gets into production, right? And if you take a step back and you look at why this is, there are fundamental technology problems that come from fundamental organizational problems that are preventing the organizations from investing in and building the right technology. And it really flows from kind of who's spending money on AI technology down to the, what technology are they building, down to what does it mean for people that are not at those companies. You know, when you look across the industry and you just dive into any segment, you can quickly see the complexity that, that people go through, right? Like, you know, when you look at, for example, the autonomous car space, it's, it's all great. You start training some models, you start labeling data, and then you realize you actually need to get these, uh, these models onto cars in a physical world and they need to operate in a similar environment. Yeah, that becomes very, very challenging when what you trained on on the serving environment, uh, on the server environment, is very different to the execution than on, you know, the raw cars. When you look at things like uh, mobile phones, it's no different. Like having spent years there, when you look at use cases like speech, automatic speech translation and, and pushing that to the edge, you know, very much we see that the performance of the models are much better closer to the user. They just respond better. There's lower latency. There's a better user experience. And yet training them on a, 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 on a you know, very large server cluster and then trying to get them onto a mobile phone is radically, radically difficult. And it's difficult because just the total pool of devices and this comes back to Chris's point on hardware, the total amount of hardware in the industry is, you know, massive. And the reality is everyone is trying to map their different hardware stacks to, you know, this software, this software plane. And it is just incredibly cha challenging for the industry. Very much of what, what we're trying to do is to say, why? Why is that the case? Why is it so broken? Uh, and, you know, I think uh, what we've seen and, you know, what we believe, and I think the future that we believe in is very much a hybrid AI future. There will be this mix of, you know, clearly large scale uh, use cases in the cloud. There will be clearly a mix of, of use cases on, on the edge, edge devices, mobile phones, but all the way down to microcontrollers. And how do you build a software stack that bridges it so people can get to both those places? Why does uh, the, the software to power AI that you are building why does that need to exist in a third-party standalone entity? Yeah, I think that, you know, particularly with the large clouds, right, like many of the customers we speak to, I think there's a few things. One, you continue to get, you know, there's a data transition onto large enterprise cloud infrastructure. But the reality is there's still a lot of, a lot of the world that remains on-prem. They still have their own, they still have their own hardware. They're, they're trying to execute and utilize that hardware and realize the cost value of that hardware. And so, you know, simply coming up with a solution that says move everything to the cloud, that's the end. You know, that's not realistic. You have to, you know, so much of what we talk about as a company is to meet customers where they are. And so, you know, our approach is to say, hey, look, we can get, to, we get to rethink this. We get to meet you wherever you are. We don't have to preference any cloud. You pick your solution, but we want to be able to build software that makes it much easier for you to be able to 
write an AI program, deploy an AI program, execute it on the hardware that you need to. And then all the other, you know, over time, uh, I think one thing that, uh, you know, that we're really passionate about is, is continuing to build into customers' needs. It's not to say like we are only taking one tiny little slice of the AI space. I think we're starting where it is most difficult and where we have such an incredible group of people and incredible talent uh, to be able to do that. But, but once you have that, you know, I think the ability to build upwards is, is, is fairly obvious in our, in our opinion. Innovating in hardware is so expensive. And when you do so, you have to build your own stack, which fragments the world. And then getting adoption of your hardware is just so much more difficult. And so we see this potential explosion revolution that can come from the software hardware boundary shifting. And, you know, the way I, the way I look at modular is that, you know, we will never have a cloud. We will never have hard, our own hardware team. Right. We're not trying to work in those spaces. We're merely AI first. <laughs> Chris, you've had the, the pleasure, I'm sure, the potential uh, challenge of working for several tech luminaries. You, know, you were early at Apple, worked for Steve Jobs. You spent time at Tesla under Musk. You spent time at Google under Jeff Dean. would love to hear a little bit more about, uh, you know, maybe how how some of those folks have impacted how you think about products? Apple has taught me that engineering doesn't matter without product, right? Being technology first puts you into a very strange place because you have a technology or a solution for a problem and you go in search of a problem. Like as Tim has said quite eloquently, we're customer first. Like we want to solve problems. We want to work backwards from that. And often the solution looks like something that is much simpler than a technology first solution. Because at the end of the day, you know, what I learned from Apple is that customers don't care about your product. They care about getting something else done. Right. And so if you can be subtractive in terms of complexity, then your customers will be happier because they'll have more brain space for the problem they're trying to solve instead of having to figure out all of your code names and weird features and things like this. What does the world look like five or 10 years from now? When Modular is a massive, you know, public company that supplies the software uh, that underpins AI for the world, what, what's different about the world? How is it a better place? You know, I tend to subscribe to the law of accelerating returns, right? Which, which Ray Kurzweil has, has uh, talked about. I mean, you just look at where we where we are as an industry, even just ten years ago. Uh, you know how quickly we have advanced in this space, and so you know, and that's with, frankly. Hmm. Terrible software. I mean, uh, <laughs> everyone we speak to is, uh, you know, continues to tell us, please make things easier to use. Please make things more simple. I mean, that's the reality, right? Like have debug messages that are just easy to use. <laughs> and so, you know, so much of it for us is is continuing to focus on, I think, two things. One, you know, what, is, what, are, what do businesses need? How can we realize AI value for them faster how can we meet them where they are and take them to a much better future? That's one thing. But two, also, what are you like? What do consumers want? Where do people want to go? And generally, we see big things. We see things like they want more privacy. They want faster experiences. They want experiences that are closer to them. They are now buying into ecosystems rather than individual products. And so, you know, I think at the end of the day, uh, you know, we have a strong belief that AI is really a human augmentative technology. And so, so much of what we're trying to achieve is make the developer experience much easier and much faster. That's certainly, you know, the prerogative of what we do, of what we're trying to do. 